Okay, hello and welcome everybody to this week's lesson. We're going to discuss today the truth behind the top five nutrition headlines. We're going to debunk the myths with Professor Grant Schofield here today. Um, we've all heard the headlines before, you know, eggs will kill us, bacon will give us cancer, cholesterol is deadly, we've heard all of that. Are the studies wrong? Is the media trying to kind of, you know, give us clickbait? Um, so today we're incredibly lucky to be joined by Professor Grant Schofield to cut through all the fluff and wonder that we hear in the media. Uh, but first I want to thank Grant. So thank you for joining us today. This really is a privilege to have you here. I um, feel very fortunate to count you, Grant, as a mentor, a friend, and a professional colleague. So I'm very, very lucky. And you are 100%, 100% the reason I discovered low-carb nutrition and inadvertently kind of set me on the path to creating Ditch the Carbs. I remember in one of your lectures, you said, you know what, you guys, it's up to you to get out there and spread the word and let everyone know about this. And it absolutely is. So um, you and, are... The... And boy, boy, haven't you done that? <laughs> <laughs> well, one or two things. <laughs> but you, you, are, you are the absolute phenomenal force behind low-carb nutrition worldwide, the whole movement. And um, you're making real change in public health as well. And I'm just going to read your bio because I won't remember it all. You're the professor of public health. You're the director of Auckland University of Technology Human Potential. Your research focuses on disease prevention, physical activity and nutrition health promotion, and even urban design, which I love to encourage physical activity. And you're now the government's chief education advisor in health and nutrition, yay. And you're author of my favorite, favorite book of What the Fat and What the Fast. So welcome, Grant. <laughs> Oh, thanks for having me. It's just my privilege, actually, to be on Ditch the Carbs. Wow. Oh, man. Well, you started, all, honestly, when I went to you, you know, the few, um, it was, there was a workshop up at AUT, and then you had a couple of other bits and pieces that you went up there, and then that you've had since lots of other workshops and um, sort of, you know, presentations up there. Honestly, that has set me, it was all these, when I went to it, all these light bulb moments were kind of going off and going, that, why didn't I know this sooner? As a pharmacist, why didn't I know this? You know, it's, it's, yeah. It, it is it is amazing <laughs> so look let's talk about the debunk the top five minutes before we start though you know we see all this advice changing on a weekly basis in the media and we see you know one week should be enjoying um bacon and one week we should be enjoying red wine you know how do we know what to believe and do the nutrition headlines do you think they truly reflect the science that's actually out there well it's obviously you know everyone wants some clickbait they want to get you to their site <laughs> and benefit from that but but there's there's slightly more to it than that i like i the first thing i think people should do you go well because because studies can be done in all sorts of different ways like there's, there's 50 ways to do a study you know, from a, a mouse study to a cross-sectional population to do a natural experiment with humans so the, i reckon there's three things you'd ask yourself you go first of all is this is this true because is even the headline match what they're saying in the article is that even true because <laughs> It could, that, there's your first thing. It's not even true. Um, and is it true for humans? Because often you'll see an animal study and it might be useful, but it's not likely. Often mm. not. Um, and if it is true, um, what's the size of what they're talking about? Like the red meat causing cancer is a classic for that. I guess we'll get to that. But yeah, yeah. yeah there might be some evidence for processed meat, but the effect's really small. And if it, if it is true and the size of the effect is of some size, is it worth it? Because there's always a trade off. Um, you know, you can't eat your bacon anymore. So, so that's the basic filter you, you've got to go through because it, it might not be worth it. Like yeah. statins, for example, might save a few lives, but it's probably not worth it for the side effects. So, so the, you know, you, you weigh those. Exactly, exactly. And like, just so people have a real basic understanding of how nutrition studies work, what is the, can you explain in this kind of a nutshell, what's the difference between causation and correlation? And are they... <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the trouble is in nutrition is that often you want to study things over a long time and you want to get to endpoints. Like endpoints are really good. So endpoints in epidemiology and uh, nutrition epidemiology are things like dying. Like yeah. that's a, quite a hard endpoint, like, which, you know, not to be too stuck about it, it was pretty yeah. obvious that it's happened. Uh, and then there's, there's other endpoints like having a heart attack or a stroke or, or developing dementia, something like that. Those, those are, pretty solid but then there's still a chance of misdiagnosis and then there's there's just other things happening like your cholesterol went up or your blood sugar went up or something 
And the, the trouble is to study those things to actually endpoints, it's really hard to do experiments with diet mm -hmm. because people won't stay on that the whole time. So you end up doing these cross-sectional studies and inferring things that way. So you trade the a whole bunch of things that you get from doing an experiment, which is you know you caused it because it's the only thing you changed. Mm -hmm. And you randomize people to rule out all other possible causes. Uh, but you can't follow them up long enough or have them stick long enough. So you do population studies. And so we're in this difficult position in nutrition where we're confounded by looking at these big cross-sectional studies and inferring causation. Now, this is not the first time this has happened in history because it happened with tobacco smoking. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in Austin Bradford Hill, the guy who, who really changed mathematics, you don't have to do a trial to infer causation mm -hmm. because that smoking one was never going to be done. But, but he sets up these things called the Bradford Hill criteria going, actually, you need some other things in place. And so the size of the effect, the size of the correlation would probably have to be massive for you to take it seriously. Like your chance of getting uh, carcinoma of the lung, lung cancer, from smoking is about ninefold over someone else just sitting around who doesn't smoke. Mm -hmm. That sort of size of, of, of correlation is unlikely to be due to anything else. But if you get something very small, like, oh, you're, uh, you re replace saturated fat with polyunsaturated fat and your chance of some midpoint goes down by this very small amount, it, it's so incredibly confounded, there's just no way. Mm. Yeah. And you talk about the Bradford Hill criteria and that they were set so that you can tell the good quality studies and like you say, the exact has that what you're studying, is that actually what the result is causing? <clears throat> Sorry, it has made the effect of. Um, what do you think are the main failings of nutrition studies? Do you th and, and the way it's reported, do you think they just cherry pick what they think of as out there? And like you said, you, you mentioned that is what they're reporting actually what the study says? Is it because like I say, they're just cherry picking what they think or is they just, they're just misinterpreting the data when they put it in the, in the headlines? And do people have their own agenda? <laughs> well, all of those probably. And it's hard to disaggregate that because we're all biased. Yeah. And, and that was the whole uh, sort of Max Planck type stuff. Science moves one funeral at a time. And nutrition's never been a science that's had that, that's had that problem. So nutrition's had that problem more than anyone else. Mm. That we've had an old guard, we had a hypothesis that was reasonable. Like when you think about it, the lipid hypothesis and the diet heart hypothesis proposed, like it, it's quite reasonable. Like eating fat would translate to fat in your blood, and that fat in the blood would cause atherosclerosis and heart disease. And fat, because it's calorie dense, would make you fatter. And it just turns out they're spelt the same. That's the only thing in common. <laughs> so the, so so the, the, but the hypothesis is reasonable. It yeah. deserved to be tested, and it, then it just didn't turn out to be true, but we've hung on to it for some reason. So, so that's the main reason is the dissonance. Because it would appear to be logical. You know, that, I think that's what people think of, and I think that's no matter how much science is out there to disprove yeah. like the lipid hypothesis, people think, but it's logical. You eat fat, you get fat. You eat fat, it's going to, you know, clog up your arteries and da-da. So it would seem logical, and it would seem obvious, but actually the converse is true once you do the studies into it. Absolutely. And that's mm. just, and, and we've had a trouble changing our mind. Yeah, and, and then you, so you still answer the rest of the questions about why, 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 why it happens, and it's because there's I, I think there's often a whole bunch of things. If we took that Austin Bradford Hill criteria and we said, look, if there's a small effect, that's interesting, publish it, but do not say anything causes anything or do not make yeah. public health recommendations <laughs> would probably be way ahead. And if we could somehow measure diet from some other more accurate way than just people self-reporting it, then we'd probably be way ahead as well. And that's, that's another aspect, isn't it? You know, a lot of all these nutrition studies are done by the sort of, you know, your nutrition diary, your food diary, and how many of those, you know, I can barely remember what I had yesterday, trying to write it down where people are logging it, what they had, did I have one cup of broccoli? Did I have three slices of bacon? What was it? And then, you know, how, part, how accurate is actually that as well? Yeah, and possibly confounded and, poss um, yeah, and just shown to be inaccurate, grossly yeah. inaccurate. And, and then systematic biases with different populations. So people, the heavier you are, the more you underreport, and those sorts of things. How do you adjust for that? We can't. Because if you don't write it down, you didn't need it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and you talk about confounded, you know, can you ex briefly explain what are confounding factors? I know you discussed it, you know, briefly there before. Well, I, I, the most interesting confounding factor, I think, which is good ammunition for people, is uh, in T. Colin Campbell's China study, the sort of big vegetarian-vegan versus animal protein study. 
and you see them going, well, uh, A, animal protein is associated with B, higher levels of, of cholesterol. Uh, cholesterol B is associated with C, higher levels of cancer. Therefore, A must cause C. But then, in fact, what you actually notice is that, uh, that hepatitis runs quite high in the Chinese population, around 15%, and that itself causes high cholesterol. And that is the, that is, that's the confounding variable. And so, so what's causing cancer here? To liver and pancreatic cancer and those sorts of things yeah. in the Chinese population is, is hepatitis. And that's a confounding variable. So they're going, well, well, the animal protein caused the cancer. You go, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, so that's, that's, that's a confounder. And I think obviously the whole diet heart lipid hypothesis is confounded with it. Numerous things as well. Exactly. Well, let's crack on to the five. Let's go through the five. And these are kind of five generic headlines, which you will find some different variation, whether it's in the paper tomorrow or on the radio last week. But number one, red meat will give you cancer. And also, what effect do you think that's also, I think that's having a negative effect. You know, we, first of all, we'll talk about what the headline is. But, you know, what effect is that having on, you know, women of childbearing age avoiding meat and, you know, being iron deficient, anemia, zinc deficient? You know, what, what do you think of that headline? Because that's the big one. Yeah, it doesn't really tell the story because let's just go back through what I said at the start, mm. which is, is the effect real? Yeah. So I, th I think it's possible the effect is real for processed meat. Yes. And I think the, the cancer we're talking about is probably colorectal or bowel cancer. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that effect is probably real. I think the effect probably isn't real for fresh red meat. Um, although one study in the US shows small effects across a range of cancers. Uh, mm -hmm. Although in saying that, I regard all US meat as processed meat. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we don't see such effects in Australia and New Zealand and European cohorts. So is the effect real? Maybe it is for processed meat. Is mm -hmm. the effect big? No, it's bloody small. So we're talking about uh, a seven-year risk of bowel cancer of going from 0.5 of 1% to 0.6 of 1%. Now, you don't want to be in that 0.1% <laughs> absolute increase if, if that's possible. So the question is, is it worth it? Mm. Is it worth moving, worth moving a whole population from from being meat eaters to non meat eaters and their possible side effects? And I think there's mm. probable side effects. You'll probably re replace things with with some higher starch and carbohydrates. I think that's likely to increase other chronic diseases. You're likely to see other things like anemia and iron deficiencies rear the head. Depression. And depression. Well, mm. that's right. So uh, there are a similar cohort studies going. Uh, there's there's a, a cohort of 90,000 as you start to remove animal products the people who eat meat ch uh, dairy fish and chicken versus the people who don't have uh, are protected against depression so if you don't eat animal products you're two and a half times more likely to have depression now that's an effect that's much bigger than the cancer one mm. so so yeah I, I think probably uh, the the trade-off isn't worth it yeah uh, so should, should we, should we Endeavour to, and also I guess the other thing about trying to disaggregate what is processed meat in those those foreign categories. There's a lot of difference between a, a finely fermented uh, Italian salami and a hamburger, which includes the bun and everything, and a hot dog, which is included in, generally included in the same category. So you're you're struggling to deal with that. Exactly. So, so that I don't even know what you make of that answer. So probably there's a small effect. Is it worth it? Probably not. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that almost runs on to one of the other ones I was going to ask you about. Bacon causes heart disease. And, you know, we talked about co confounding errors there. Well, yeah. do bacon eaters often eat more bread with their bacon and then the tomato sauce, which is full of sugar, and then they drink it down with, a you know, a glass of fizzy drink. And then are the, those people who were possibly in the study, are they more likely to be smokers or type 2 diabetics? And that's what they're not reporting in the media, is it? No, and it's incredibly confounded in the sense that uh, given we've had this message for a number of years, then you end up that being a different demographic and there's all sorts of things that you can't measure. So it's really impossible to tell. Um, mm. I would say something about meat, bacon, and all of the chronic diseases. The one thing that I still think is plausible, there were two things I think are plausible that they could mm -hmm. have bad effects. One is uh, a simple thing that when you do feeding studies with people 
then adding some sort of saturated fat type stuff to your carbohydrate, mm-hmm. if you're insulin sensitive, it dulls the insulin response. If you're mm-hmm. insulin resistant, sometimes it can make it worse. Uh, I don't know why that is. So mm-hmm. there's a conceivable reason that for some people, extra fat with your carbs, you know, a la the standard American diet might be quite bad. <laughs> and it's also possible, it's also possible, and Ron Krauss has seen this in his lab in the States, that when you feed people consistent amounts of red meat, this is the sort of studies funded by the American Cattlemen's Association and that sort of stuff, mm-hmm. and then you get higher iron and you get adverse lipid responses, mm-hmm. which I don't know why that is. It can be to the exact same fat and saturated fat from the dairy. Uh, if you just have red meat at every meal, you do get a, an adverse lipid response compared to the exact same fat from dairy. Uh, so those are just two things to to watch out for. That it's conceivable there could be other mechanisms. Right. Yeah. So I mean, the, at the end of the day, the, the headlines are kind of sensationalised, and it's not a yet again not the full picture and not the entire picture, is it? No. And if you can advise the public to do something, you want to be pretty sure it's not going to have adverse effects. Exactly. Otherwise, you end up with otherwise you end up with the food pyramid and have the biggest <laughs> medical misadventure of all time. Yeah. You know, so how's that end up for everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Not very well. Not very well at all. <laughs> So the number one we've got then is butter causes heart disease and cholesterol is deadly. Those kind of sensationalised headlines. What do you think about those? Well, I just think it's unlikely that the A, the butter, raises cholesterol, which it does probably, uh, and then that raising cholesterol is associated with heart disease. You've got A causes, mm. A is associated, weakly associated with B, B is weakly associated with C, but in no way can make you infer that A causes C. Yeah. It's as simple as that. And so uh, the whole saturated fat thing, there's, of all the meta-analysis that have been done of the randomized trials, um, one effect in one paper for not even endpoints, just uh, more cardiovascular events shows a very small association with it, with reducing saturated fat. Uh, you improved. But actually, myself and um, Dr. Simon Thornley, also a New Zealander, we just published a paper last week showing that that is an artifact of the particular random effects meta-analysis that they've used. And if you do it another way, that even that disappears. <laughs> so so I, I think the evidence is just not there for that. The one proviso is, again, of course, that feeding study, add, eat your baked potato, there's your glucose and insulin response, add your butter. If you're insulin sensitive, it helps. If you're insulin resistant, it makes it worse. Mm. And I don't know, I have no idea what that mechanism is. And we go, you know, it go, you know, we talk about, you know, with the um, nutrition designs and how they're studied and how animal um, tests and animal designs are different to humans. You know, when they feed cholesterol and saturated fat to um, rabbits, they have a complete, who are herbivores, has a completely, completely different response to when you feed it in omnivores. So you can't, you know, use the two to one another. Well, no, that's exactly right. That 1926 experiment of rabbit mm. feeding, that, uh, that feeding them dietary cholesterol caused arthrosclerosis is nonsense was nonsense it doesn't mm. that same effect doesn't happen in humans and in fact if we consume dietary cholesterol then we just produce less of it ourselves and if we don't consume enough we produce more so it's a, it's a necessary bit of biochemistry in humans for transporting stuff around the body and yeah. we, we, we just produce it the basis of hormones the basis of cell membranes everything and i remember reading an, an article and it was an interview with keys um towards the end of his life and even he said look we've known for years we've always known that dietary cholesterol does not affect you know cholesterol in the blood we've known that for years so it, it, even he said it, and he was you know the <laughs> we all know what <laughs> he's did for us <laughs> yeah yeah so and, and it's interesting that the eggs one sort of snuck back and, oh, yeah, we sort of got that wrong. No one's actually sort of putting their hand up and owning it and going, we got no. that wrong. But, but it's just and sort of gone. Some oh, of the heart right associations now. around the world, I think Canada is one of the first, they've slowly removed the restriction of eggs off of their website, yet they haven't declared to everyone, you know what, you know, go for it. Eggs are back on the menu, go for it. They've yeah. kind of slowly just retreated. Well, it's interesting the New Zealand Heart Foundation have removed their restriction on eggs for healthy people but still have a restriction on one to two a week for people who have had, had a heart attack. And it's just like, really? What are, like, <laughs> <laughs> Where's the logic in that? <laughs> yeah, I can't, I don't get Honestly, that we live off eggs. I don't know how much, we must go, I don't know, 30, 50 eggs a week in this house. We go through a lot of eggs. There's no scare of mongering here. <laughs> well, look, we, we order in you know, this, these boxes of meat and veg that we get 
on Mondays, and they actually rang us a couple of weeks ago. And go, I think you must have missed ordered on the eggs. You've ordered, <laughs> you've ordered, you've ordered four dozen. Uh, yeah. and that would be really unusual. Like, what's going on there? And we're like, oh no, no that's right. Oh, <laughs> that's probably that'll probably give me through to Wednesday. Then I'll, I'll yeah. Four. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so we've covered. So I think the last one we've covered all, and we've covered red meat causes you cancer. No, butter causes heart disease. No, statins could save. Oh, statins could save thousands of lives. And the fact that I mean, I know as a pharmacist, you know that that when I used to dispense statins to everybody else, um, but I know in you know the studies that are funded by industry are 30 times more likely to be produce favorable results you know than anyone else you know what do you say about that that you know statins could save thousands of lives we should be starting giving them to children put them in the water that's kind of almost what's coming out in the news isn't it <laughs> that's, that's interesting isn't it so the, again it's the effect real mm. uh, 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 lives saved and studies randomized trials and the answer is there might be actually a few, um, but the effect's fairly small, and it's probably restricted to men who have already had heart attacks. It's yeah. probably the major beneficiary. And so the question is, is it because of the cholesterol mechanism or is there something else good about the statin, or who knows? Or well, anti-inflammatory. Anti-inflammatory thing. So, yeah. so could they save lives? They have potential to, absolutely. Uh, is, is, there, is the effect big? No, it's probably fairly small. Mm. Um, and is it worth it? Well, that's the big question, I think, with statins. Is it worth it? Mm. Because we know there's equal chance of getting diabetes. Yep. We know that there's, depending on the study, there might be as high as one in three people get myopathy, sore muscles. Mm -hmm. uh, so there might be one in six or one in 10 get uh, quite severe, debilitating brain fog. Yep. So the question is, is that worth it? And the only person who can make that decision, I think, and this is true of all medication, is the person who's willing to take it because someone actually might decide that's worth it mm. but if I, I, given the numbers i think a lot of people when they prescribe these medication aren't given the numbers do you know we need to treat x number of people for x number of years to yeah. possibly save one person and i think if they're given the numbers then they can make a more informed choice but it might it also depends on the context because so just imagine mm. this is a as a as a, a prescription scenario i go to you maybe I've, I've got a new drug uh if you take it you've got a four out of five chance of getting another 10 years of awesome life. That's four and five, but you've got a one in five chance of dropping dead instantly. Now, probably you're going to go, no, I'm not, gonna, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not taking that. Right. And I go, no, you say no, right. You're saying no. Yeah. I'll say no. <laughs> okay. Right. Fair enough. I don't want a 20% chance of dropping dead. <laughs> no, no, no. But imagine my my eighty one year old father at the moment does actually have metastatic prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. um, it's fairly advanced and it's all through his body. He might be he might think that's an awesome opportunity. Yeah. So so the context of the harm versus benefit will definitely change things, and there will be a point you'll go yeah bring it on. So yeah. you know what if we got up to a, a million to one. Do you reckon you would? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, so so I think to me that's the, the the only the word prescription in of itself in medicine is it's just the wrong word. It sounds like I'm telling you what to do. Yeah. And it, uh, any procedure, medication, whether it be just advice around diet, whether it be exercise, whether it be medications and, and other pharmaceuticals, whether it be a, a, an operation, an orthopedic operation or whatever, you want to know, what are my chances of benefit? Mm. What are those benefits? What are my chances of harm? What are those harms? And it's only you who can weigh those up because... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, brain fog compared to a heart attack, well, only you know what you'd prefer. Yeah, exactly <laughs> so, right. And your doctor doesn't know that. And that leads us on to my fifth and final nutrition headline is that this one that came out recently and it was a Lancet study, but it was mis again misreported. Low carb can shorten lifespan. Oh my Lord. Yeah, that, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is quite often quoted because there's some, so there are some actually studies. So there's this, uh, there's a one of Swedish woman's longitudinal health study where mm -hmm. they did some scores with fat and protein and carb intake. And they showed that the, a sort of composite rough score of, of protein and fat intake 
the people who had the highest score on that had the highest mortality. Mm -hmm. and it, none of them were eating low carb. It doesn't reflect low carb. That's ex that's but, exactly but, right, isn't yeah. it? None of them were actually low carb. They reported yeah. them as being low carb, but when you look at it, you go, mm, "That's not right. low carb." <laughs> no, that's right. So, so I'm not aware of any of those longitudinal population studies that show that. Well, except for you get some contradictory results, like the Pure study, which is probably the biggest, most comprehensive worldwide study looking at cross-sectional stuff, shows benefits of higher fat across every. Mm. and saturated fat and, and, and problems with carbohydrate. And it's plausible why that would happen. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I think the jury's out on that. I still don't think you need to make a recommendation to the public about low carb. I think mm. you make a recommendation to the public about whole food. Yeah, whole don't food. Even, don't even mention macronutrients. No. Uh, you don't put any restriction on fat, protein, and carbohydrates in the context of, of you know, recently alive food. <laughs> but you do you do give advice at the end of those dietary guidelines saying if you can't control you, you do need to you need to restrict the amount of carbohydrate in your diet to the degree necessary to control the blood your blood sugar yeah and to stop and stop the hypersecretion of insulin that's sort of a note to health professionals yeah and if I that mean, dietary guideline said that would be fine I often say to people, we eat whole, when you sort of eat whole food, you almost become low carb by default. You know, you're not on the junk food, you're not on the sodas, you're not on the sugary things. As long as people don't suddenly, and people will always take from nutrition advice what they want. And if they suddenly hear it's just whole food, great, I can make my cakes with, you know, with dates and honey and everything. That's whole food. But yeah. as long as you put that caveat at the bottom about looking after your, you know, your carbohydrate intake to stabilize your blood sugars, I think that's a brilliant kind of, that kind of captures everybody. Well, that's right. Because, it, because it's conceivable that you can be a young very active person and you could eat a lot more starch and be just substantively fine. Doesn't mm. mean you couldn't be low carb, but that exact same diet for someone else who's older like me would have a profoundly different effect on their metabolism. And that's, mm. so I think, I think, yeah, sh sh should, should we be advising people against low carb in public health? Absolutely not. Do we have to come out and go, Everyone should be low carb. No, of course we don't. We should be starting with whole food. Well, That's where the evidence is. It was on the news this morning. They were again. They were talking about oh, you know, this is you know what is keto? What, um, you know, how important is it? Or does it even work? And the the um, TV presenter was saying, oh, that's ridiculous. You know, you have to give up sugar and alcohol and biscuits and cakes and junk food. You know, what kind of life is that? And it's like, but if people want to, you know, I think people in the media shouldn't mock people who want to be healthy. That's that's my kind of if I could put one thing out there for the media, don't yeah. mock the people who want to be that way. You know, I'm not mocking them if they want to. their diet. He's on a diet. He's on a diet of junk food, you know, yeah. and if he wants to do that. That's absolutely his prerogative, but then don't mock the portions of society who actually want to live healthy, the best life that they can. Um, yeah. and, and I just think this sort of, it's almost kind of some, like I say, mockery in, in the media sometimes of how we eat. But like you say, it goes back to just eating whole food, real food, that was once alive has short expiry dates and um, yep. food that our great, great grandparents would, would recognize and eating ingredients, not products. It's pretty simple. Well, you'd think it was that simple. And I agree that <laughs> at first class it's simple, but I, I actually just did a, a public debate in Taupo in the center of New Zealand last week, a, a packed house, 450 people at the convention center, the mayor and everything there. And I'm debating the local dietitians and a vegan doctor. Oh dear. <laughs> well, it was astonishing. I tell you what's astonishing is that the dietitian's best advice is there's no point worrying about your weight. We can't sort that out. Health at any weight, just forget about it. So they've given up on that, trivialized a, an issue that's crucial for our society. Yeah. And, and their number one piece of advice is no diet or, or restrictions around anything works. So eat what you like and as long as you're happy. Like they've, it's like they've given up. It's like turning up to a building site as a builder with only a spade. So you're walking around, you're supposed to be building someone a house and you're just digging random holes around the site. No use to anyone. In fact, you'll hurt someone. So, that, so that's, that's that. Astonishing. And then the second is in the vegan, well, we don't call it vegan, it's plant-based. It's not plant-based, it's only plants. Yeah. It's like the, 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 it's just trial after trial after trial quoted to you. But mm. as always, we put someone on a vegan diet compared to having the standard American diet. Look at the improvements. And again, that's just not good enough. The, yeah. Because we've compared them head to head, AZ diet study, and they're, they're inferior. 
to low carb. Mm. Simple as that. So, so the public debate is, oh my gosh, in, in, a, in a state that you just despair yeah. at. And the, the plant-based agenda in particular uh, is, is, I find, particularly uh, interesting. Mm. Yes. <laughs> I'm going to keep my opinions to myself. Otherwise, I'll get, the, um, I'll get spammed by all the haters. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you can imagine. Okay, so what about, so they are great. I mean, I think we've pretty much dissected all the five nutrition top headlines there. And, you know, we've looked at why, why they can be incorrect, how they can be misquoted, everything like that, and they're sensationalized. So what would be maybe your three tips for dissecting? If you ever see, you know, anyone out there watching this lesson today, if they look at a nutrition headline, or what's worse is when a concerned family member comes up to them and goes, hey, listen, I've just read in the newspaper that that diet that you're on, you know, and it's not a diet, it's how, you know, the old thing, it's how we live, we eat unprocessed food, but that diet you're on is going to kill you, or that diet is going to give you cancer. What's, what tips would you give to people out there to go, well, how can they pick through those nutrition headlines, and how can they help their family member, their concerned family member, actually not be so worried about what they've just read? So let's just go through that from top to bottom. Is it real? Is mm. the headline even real? Does the headline even match what's in the article? Yeah. Is the study design real? Mm -hmm. Because to test that, so a couple of people looking at them or you know, the blue zones is a classic. They live here. It's not an experiment. It's just people living with a whole bunch of confounding things do the same thing. So is, is it real? Yeah. If it is real, is... Was, was it done in actual humans, not animals? <laughs> so that, those, those are all, is it real? Filters. If it is real, how big is the effect? And you can never tell the effect with what we call relative risk. So mm -hmm. if someone says there's a 40% increase in cancer, that tells you nothing. Mm. Like you have no idea what that means in reality because you need to know what the absolute prevalence of cancer was. Yeah. If it's two people on a thousand and there's a 40% uh, improvement that's that's a very small effect if there's 400 people in a thousand with cancer and there's a 40 percent improvement that's a massive effect yeah so 40 percent of what of what yeah. and it's almost never reported it's yeah. almost never reported so is the effect big or small and then on the size of that effect you go well is it worth it what you need to do to 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 get that effect. Do you think so, in the future that when nutrition studies or any kind of health studies are reported in the media, they actually need to be um, almost, um, you know, like qualified health journalists that report it rather than just a journalist who skim reads it and goes, ah, they grab a headline and then they turn that into a story. Actually, I don't think that, I don't think that even helps, but that could help. But mm. I think the researchers themselves aren't literate enough to, to, to interpret things like the Because you go through their whole paper and they haven't mentioned anything but the absolute risk, mm. uh, but the relative risk. They never even, you, never, you have to go back and to supplementary tables to work this out. So mm. I think, I think that if we had a template for reporting in, in the abstract of a paper, that, or you had a, always had a lay abstract that had to include these things, mm. then that would, the journalists would find it really easy. Yeah. And so, maybe also have as well where, where they're linked to an industry, and then that will show you the bias of whether you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, that's 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 the that's the million dollar one, isn't it? Yeah, that may never ever happen. Yes, yeah, sponsored yeah. by. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I've got three questions for you from my membership. You know, people always are, I'm allowed to ask them three questions from my membership here. When friends, and I think you've already answered this anyway, when friends and family love to share their anti-low carb headlines, how do we respond? And I think you've pretty much gone through that anyway, haven't you? Looking to, is it real? Does it apply to us? And what yeah. are the actual results? Yeah. 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 So number two is, how much processed meat should we enjoy? And I think we've answered that as well. Well, also, you could be a little bit more specific about that. So the studies that do show negative effects, people are eating about 90 grams or more mm. of Processed meat a day. Below that, there's no real effects. 90 grams of processed meat is a lot of processed yeah. meat. Uh, and again, I still think there's going to be something in the quality, like a a, a smoke cured bacon from your butcher that's sliced up on the spot is very different from one that's grown with uh, with with hormones injected with water or a 
do you remember? I don't even know if you can still buy them in this country. Remember those sort of lunch and sausage things we had when oh, we were kids? And you can buy them. They used to, a while ago, they brought out a purple range of them. I mean, oh, that's yeah. vile beyond all belief. But yeah. you see the kids munching on them around the supermarket. And I mean, I always say, you know, people say, oh, you used a lot of ham in your recipes. And I go, yeah, but I, there's a huge difference between ham off the bone and then yeah. that closest ham that looks like the shape of a dinosaur or it's in the shape of a face or that's mushed up ham. That's processed garbage with yeah. fillers and there might be, say, 20% meat in there. That's completely and utterly different to ham off the bone or chicken off the bone. You know, chicken, you can go buy roast chicken at the dinner mm. counter as opposed to chicken slices, which are normally... It, what chicken has ever seen produce a roll of chicken, it is, you know, and they slice it up. That's just processed chicken. So, right, as opposed to a well cured chorizo sausage type thing, is a very exactly, different product. Exactly. And so, like, it's by the best, unpro least processed meat that you can buy. You know, roast chicken, roast ham, roast whatever the meat is as close as nature intended it off the animal, yeah. as opposed yeah. to mushed ham into a shape of a dinosaur or, like you said, those pre cooked sausages and the ones they do in sausage sizzles, which you know, a probably twenty. Oh my goodness! Meat. Yeah. Oh, that, 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 that's just a uh, <laughs> yeah, so, huge difference, oh. isn't there, between processed meat and ultra processed meat? There's a massive, massive difference. Well, actually, that's a very good point. We should start using that uh, those terms more mm. specifically around processed meats, ultra processed versus processed. Mm, it is. Mm. And then my third one is this is a good one for you because you um you help in what is it? You're the health ed education advisor and health and nutrition. If low carb provides us so many benefits, somebody has asked, why haven't the guidelines changed and what can we do? <laughs> well, first of all, I, I did that job as the chief health and nutrition advisor for the Ministry of Education for nearly two years. Um, and on my 50th birthday, I woke up at, eight, at quarter to eight and by quarter past eight, I'd written my resignation letter and quit. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I felt that, originally I felt that being in government would be a real a really good thing around yeah. making change. And what I've, I think I've learned is that the only, there used to be a show on TV called Yes Minister, where yeah, everyone sort of runs around and says whatever the minister says. And I think that's absolutely still true. So the only place if you want to change those things is at a political level. And as a public servant, you've got zero power at the political level. In fact, you've got less than what you'd have just as me now uh, as an academic and advocate and as you have, because you, you actually have to shut up and you sign a piece of paper, paper saying you'll shut up. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the nutrition, so I think there's a few things. First of all, the nutrition guidelines are clearly a disgrace. There's vested interest. The mm. fact that we still have these sort of health rating systems in, in Australia and New Zealand, at least, which, you know, endorse sugary, ultra processed food. I go for the one stars, you know, butter and cream. It's all got one star. They're the ones you go oh, for. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you turn it, you, like everything else, you do it the other way around. Yeah. They, they, they're not going to change anytime soon. I think mainly because of the food industry mm. uh, has got a lot of interest in there. So that's not going to happen. Um, would society be better if they did change? I actually think uh, you immediately wouldn't notice stuff, but there's some things that would massively change. So the, the, and I think the major one is hospital food. Yes. Hospital food is a disgrace. And that's why they need to change. That's why we need to change it. Yeah. Prison food's a disgrace. And that, probably should improve as well uh some school foods are disgrace mm. but uh for the public at large it probably be. i i think the only thing we can do and i often say this to the people is that vote with our wallets you know yeah. vote and don't buy those foods um buy and pe you know you can already see new sort of products and things coming into the into the supermarket shelves now because they're knowing people are going towards the sugar-free you know or lower sugar um um meals or drinks or whatever it is that they're going for and just vote with our wallets don't buy those junk foods don't buy those things you know some of the products that are out there have got five star health ratings they've only got the five stars because they've added milk to it or they've added something else to it and that's what yep. gave them the stars not the original product and like you say unless we can somehow get in there and change industry or suddenly industry has some kind of you know moral dilemma tomorrow that will actually <laughs> help us <laughs> yeah, um, i think that's all we can do is and, and someone else said, you know, the, it will take 20 to 30 years to change the guidelines. Well, I'm not going to wait around for that long. So vote with our wallets and stop buying these things. Well, the only trouble with the voting with your wallet is it's had its, it's, it's, had its own effect on us in many ways. Because in this country, the price of butter has almost doubled over the last <laughs> yeah, three or four years. As the demand has just skyrocketed where people yeah. have actually realised they've been completely conned and they've started eating it again, which is a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Way up. So, exactly. yeah, anyway.
Yeah. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Guy. That was absolutely fabulous. And I think hopefully everyone will come away knowing about the top five headlines, knowing how to answer their concerned family members that obviously come up with them and to them and sort of say they're very concerned about, you know, their cholesterol is going to be raised, they're in the line to a heart attack. I think we've we've cleared up all those myths and all the fluff and wonder. Um, so thank you very much for joining us today, Grant. Thanks for having me. It's awesome. Okay.